Hello, my name is Mauro Guillén. I'm a professor at the Wharton School. Today, we're having a conversation with Professor Kent Smetters, who is a professor of business economics and public policy at the Wharton School, and he's also the director of the Penn Wharton Budget Model. He was Deputy Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Treasury a number of years ago. Thank you for joining us, Kent. My pleasure. So here's the first question for you. Who are the most impacted workers in the wake of this uh, coronavirus epidemic? Yeah, in terms of the economic impact, it's had the biggest impact on hospitality and other service workers. And over 35% of hospitality workers are in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Over 65% are in the bottom 40% of the income distribution. So they're pretty poor already to begin with. And they're also younger. You know, a 20 year old is four times more likely to be in the hospitality industry relative, relative to other industries. Also more likely to be less educated. Um, uh, almost half of uh, uh, hospitality workers have only a high school education or less. And, and this is a particularly vulnerable group, you know, after the 2008 recession, uh, almost 500,000 discouraged workers never returned to the workforce, and it could even be uh, worse today. Yes, uh, so I think it uh, has become obvious that the government needs to do something about the economy and about these job losses. So uh, what do you think is the best policy framework to tackle the situation from an economic point of view? Yeah, I mean, the most efficient policy system is not just being reactive. In, in particular, the best policy would be keeping people on their jobs even during a viral attack. I mean, we would almost never need a full quarantine if we planned ahead of time. However, once a risk does materialize, we need a fiscal transfer system that pools that risk. We're talking about cash payments unemployment insurance. You know, cash payments are faster, uh, they can be targeted, um, it makes more, a lot of sense distributionally, and also macroeconomic effects too. Poor people are more likely to spend the money rather than save it and create stimulus. Um, it, unemployment is interesting because it, you know, allows us to utilize the existing system, but it's not currently really set up for gig workers or those uh, workers that have many employers like hourly workers, especially a lot of hourly workers have employers who haven't paid into the system. You know, the most recent bill that's been, uh, well, at least worked its way through the Senate yesterday, tries to suspend these rules, but it's important to realize that unemployment is still administered by the states under different sets of rules. Uh, even though workers can apply online, uh, don't be fooled by that because state workers themselves need to recode the systems and they're actually uh, not able to work from home. Think, you know, legacy mainframe computer systems running COBOL and Fortran. Uh, and so many states, yeah, they, if they are, they're trying to hit these hourly workers under these new rules, I mean, it's going to be very challenging. Maybe they'll cut checks and take losses and try to recover fraud later, but it's going to be very challenging uh, for them. So the cash gets out, cash payments get out uh, sooner, the unemployment uh, checks will take longer. Yeah, so do you believe right now here in the United States we have the right policy framework in place? Uh, obviously the Congress and the White House, the Treasury Department are still negotiating the final details uh, as we uh, record this video, but uh, do you believe the U.S. Uh, government is on the right track in terms of um, having the right policy framework? Yeah, I mean, not really either pre-crisis or post-crisis. We don't really have comprehensive framework. So, you know, pre-crisis, we have a terror advisory system um, that came in after 9-11, but we don't have an equivalent for viral risk. I and mean, we have a national registry for fire engines, but not for ventilators. And uh, as a result, we don't really have resources ahead of time. And as a result of that, we can even over-respond in the short run when there's a lack of coordination. And so COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by the virus uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I mentioned that point to, to point out that we've seen SARS family viruses before. We're going to see them again. We're going to see a lot of other viruses. Uh, in fact, we actually got lucky with this one in some ways. Imagine a measles-like transmission 
with an HIV like mortality. I mean, we're talking almost nuclear war. We're not prepared uh, uh, really for you know, the really big one. So we, we need to, the ultimate goal is to keep people on their jobs as much as possible um, through proper preparation. But you know, after a crisis happens and maybe some of that is not possible, you know, we need a fiscal policy system. And our current one is far from perfect. To keep in mind, 40 percent of households today don't even have four hundred dollars to cover unexpected uh, costs. And right now we really can't target very well. How do you find the 25 percent of people who haven't even filed taxes because they don't get the earned income tax credit or or owe a positive tax bill. Now, I doubt we'll ever create a system that can really get uh, target them. I've already mentioned the problems in UI. So we really can't target well even after the fact. I don't think we ever will be. So it really the most efficient system that uh, uh, requires the most focus is ultimately keeping people at work with proper supplies, proper education, having in, in enough ventilators and other things in place in case people actually get sick. So uh, my final question for you, uh, which scenarios, which forecasts about mortality and about the economic impact of this pandemic uh, do you think business leaders right now, or more generally people working in the business sector, should believe? Yeah. So in terms of the economics, I mean, check the Penn Wharton budget model website this week and next week. We're going to actually uh, uh, pr we're already proposing a lot of things about the, the virus, but we're going to be uh, doing more uh, trying to discuss this so-called L versus V shape. You know, I think we're more likely to be in V shape, but it's not 1982 like V. And I don't think we'll ever uh, quite return to the pre-recession potential GDP level simply because we're going to have a big higher, much higher debt load uh, uh, than before. And it's not true that just because the government can borrow the low interest rate, that that doesn't matter. It, it still very much uh, uh, matters. Um, but I actually don't think business leaders should be focused so much on the, the mortality rate. And so I think what they should be focused on is creating workplaces that reduce contagion. You know, if the mortality rate happens to be 2%, which is higher than probably will be, instead of 1%, um, then actually just a small reduction in contagion uh, through, through uh, more social distancing at the workplace will more than offset that higher mortality rate. And, and so let me put, put it more mathematically, uh, and I realize uh, it's always dangerous to do a little bit of math uh, in a video, but I think this makes the, it makes it more clear. You know, the math of these models of, of viral transfer, um, they, can, they can actually produce what's called mathematically a bang-bang solution. In this case, what that means, if contagion is not contained, then the quarantines uh, that we're uh, uh, currently doing, um, they're only going to push out the mortality S-curve. It's, it's actually going to have little effect unless new vaccines or ventilators or therapies happen to arrive um, in time. But that's very unlikely. Um, instead, you would have to have quarantines that last a very long time, you know, six months, nine months. I mean, it could be catastrophic uh, to the economy. On the other hand, if contagion is uh, more contained, even if it's not perfectly contained, um, but if it's more contained, then we actually don't need quarantines in the first place. That's the bang, bang. It's either you have to go huge or you don't need it at all. So the best thing that employers can focus on is creating a workplace that reduces contagion. And um, it, that's that's really going to, when we think about the, the best that they can do for their own workers, their own business, and what they can do socially, it's really uh, creating a better workplace. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, very wise advice. Uh, could you just uh, share with our viewers uh, the exact location uh, where they can find more information at the Penn Wharton budget model? Yes, and if, if you just Google Penn Wharton budget model, you'll definitely see it. Um, and also the, the website itself is budgetmodel.wharton.upenn.edu. But probably the easiest way to do it is just Google Penn Wharton budget model. Thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. So this was um, Professor Kent Smetters from the Wharton School, the director of the Penn Wharton Budget Model, and the former Deputy Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Treasury Department.